2004, yeah. long time ago, yes, sure. Uh, for me, just a, a skip in time. Yeah, I uh, got to visit uh, Houston uh, Space Flight Center at the invitation of our good friend Slick. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a, a geologist who actually was working for NASA. So that makes him a lunologist or something, I don't know. But he was studying uh, lunar samples and various things like that, comparing them, comparing them with uh, actual geological samples from here on good old Earth. Did they bring a note? No. Oh, okay. Actually, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they took me uh, in there, uh, along with Jose Alvarez and a few other people, and uh, it was a very, very interesting tour of, uh, of the Houston Space Flight Center. I, they actually uh, took us in, uh, in to see the, the moon samples, the, the moon rocks themselves. They had to, I hate to tell you this, it's true, it's so embarrassing. They, they dressed me in this duck suit with, the, with the, the whole thing for the hat and for the hair, and they actually vacuumed my beard. And they said to me, you can never tell what living things might be in there. You can contaminate the lunar samples, you see. I mind for the lunar samples are all sealed behind glass and perspex and acrylics and whatnot and such. But it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience, really. They, they uh, cleansed me with moving air and the whole business and turned me around a cylinder and I marched out the other side in this funny suit and the slippers and the whole business. And I went over to a, a big container of moon samples, very small samples, but it's quite a variety of them. It was in a big sealed uh, plastic container like this. And on the wall, they had 00.00 in red LEDs. I sort of wondered what that was all about, but I found out very soon. There were also two key switches inside of it, each one of which took a different key, see? And uh, I went over and I looked at the case, and they said, oh, stand back, Mr. Red. And I, I stood back appropriately and obediently. Said, well, what's going to come out of here is just nitrogen, but it, it may make you cough if you take a, a, a big breath of it. I said, okay. And, and they went over, and, and two of them had to have their own individual keys to turn to activate the lock. You see, and they turned it, and they went, and opened up, and the nitrogen, I guess, came out. I didn't notice it. And uh, I saw moon rocks in front of me. So I innocently and somewhat slyly asked, uh, but I picked one up, and they said, oh yes, go right ahead. And I reached down, and I picked one out of gloves, on of course, gloves, and didn't want to contaminate them. And I looked at them. The minute I did this, those red numbers changed. That was a scale, a very accurate scale, weighing down to tenths of a gram, or maybe hundredths of a gram in this case, I'm not sure, uh, that registered whether something had been taken out of it, you see, in case a magician came by. <laughs> nature, and I looked at it, and I turned it over, and I put it back, and it came back to 0, 0.00. 0. I was appropriately impressed with that. Anyway, I got to handle other ones on gloves, but inside of latex gloves that I put my arms into, and I handled big chunks of moon rocks. It was pretty damn exciting, I'll tell you. I was holding on to pieces of the moon, <laughs> not pieces of this earth, pieces of the moon. That great men have gone out there into space to retain or to to, to gauge and to let load on the, on the spaceship, of course, and brought all the way back to Earth. Damn, that's something else. We went off this Earth to the moon, a quarter of a million miles away, took it around a few times, landed, took off again with rock samples, and brought them back to Earth. Now, what can be more exciting than an adventure like that? Anyway, at that point, uh, a gentleman, after I got out of the duck suit and the whole thing, and uh, a gentleman came over to me, a little Asian gentleman, they introduced himself as Edward Liu, L-U, and uh, he said, uh, Mr. Eddie, I had a good idea, and I was just talking it over with my colleagues here, he thought it'd be a great idea, how would you like to do the first magic trick in space? And I said, well, I'm not quite equipped, and he said, no, no, you won't go up, you'll go up, and you'll stay back on Earth, and we'll do it between Earth and, and outer space, you see. That sounds like a gym dandy idea. And I went back to the JREF and waited around until I got a phone call, and pretty soon I got a, a note from Ed Lou saying, we're gonna call you on Wednesday because I'll be up there 
at that time, and we'll give you a call from space. And I said, fine. And they said, however, uh, we weren't able to cover it the same way that we had planned originally. They were planning to have a split screen video from, uh, from the, the space shuttle, uh, the space lab, I should say, uh, video from there, and me at the JREF sitting at a table in the library there doing my part of the trick, and Ed Blue up there doing his part of the trick. They planned to do it that way, but then there, there was a problem with the launch there. They had to keep the, the cameras, the video cameras, uh, out in space. They had to keep them going to see if there were any bits of space junk floating around. That was a critical moment for them. And I said, well, by all means, you won't give up any, any security system or anything. You'll do it your way, and I'll arrange something else. So what I did is I got in some reporters from the local newspaper, the Miami Herald, I think it was. I got them into the into the library, they sit around uh, as witnesses, and uh, I set up our video system, and uh, we turned that on, put it on tripod, turned it on, and we recorded it from our end, and they recorded it from Ed Lou's end. Now, I couldn't see him at the time, but I was in contact uh, via an, an audio connection on a conference call. So, uh, we, we got in place, and uh, sure enough, right on the nose. They are on time with NASA, that's one thing. You to be sure you're on time, otherwise you're falling in the ocean or something like that. And so they were on time and the phone rang and I heard on the other end, uh, this is mission control. You don't hear that often. Mission <laughs> <laughs> control doesn't exactly call you in the middle of the day. Uh, and if that were going to make connection with uh, astronaut Ed Lou, I said, that's correct, I believe so. Then all right, the next voice you'll hear will be Ed Lou. And, uh, Ed came on and said, how are you, the whole thing. And then we uh, started to do video thing on both ends. And uh, from then on, you can see the action that took place here. Now remember, these are two videos that are edited together <coughs> but in perfect time synchronization. There. I mean, there's no gap in there or, or omissions or anything like that. Uh, but it's just a little awkward in a couple of places. Now, Ed was shameless, as you'll see. <laughs> he was out in outer space, and he was weightless, and he was doing things, you know, throwing things in the air, uh, doing all these shameless things that astronauts tend to do. But uh, I forgive him for it, because he, he's a natural showman, I guess, and uh, he, a charming gentleman, I think you'll agree with me. And the, the, the big problem, I will tell you, is after the trick was over, when he came back to Earth, literally, came back to Earth, <laughs> and uh, was wandering around in NASA there. Everyone buttonholed him, said, Ed, how did you do that card trick? And I didn't do the card trick. <laughs> I just did what he told me to do, and he did the card trick. But how did you do it? I have no idea. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Ed has now left NASA, in case you didn't know it. He's in that uh, private practice now. Oh, yes, he left some time ago. And uh, very satisfied with the work he did. And we're very satisfied to do the first card trick in space, a Louvre